Thank you, all of you, for coming. And I'm enjoying this reading so much. I'm actually going to read part of an essay that I wrote this summer. Not the whole thing, so it's kind of long, just part of it. And then I'm going to read one or two poems from Lucy, well, the Wasp Queen. So just follow the vagina, and you will find her. <laughs> um, okay. I'm not reading all these pages if anyone's getting like freaked out. <laughs> I just didn't have time to like, whatever. It was one of those days where I was like, I just need to print out a bunch of shit and like pick out what to read on the train ride. So that's what happened. A boy I will call Tommy sat next to me in 10th grade study hall. We were both equally awkward in that just hitting puberty way. His gangly body barely holding up his newly too big head. My body still not knowing what to do with the just arrived fat, filling my chest and the fresh tufts of hair sprouting like weeds in my formerly smooth orifices. Tommy stared at me and winked. Um, okay. <laughs> then he passed me a folded piece of paper, cartoonish Snickers, worming from his mouth. I unfolded the page and saw a stick figure hanging from a noose, Claudia written over the body, to make sure there was no question of who was getting hung. I looked at him and he mouthed, Dyke. That year, I rode the bus home for two months. In hindsight, it's surprising I lasted that long. In November, a girl I'll call Donna told me she was planning to murder me. <laughs> Ohio, that's all I have to say. Ohio in the 90s. <laughs> I calmly asked why she was going to commit said murder, reasoning that if I was going to die, it would be nice to know why. And she responded, it's nothing personal. I'm just a gay basher, bitch. The claim that murdering me is somehow impersonal reveals the underdeveloped critical thinking skills of our aspiring gay basher. It also reveals that she believed one of whiteness's most sacred myths. Violence can be impersonal. That it isn't more intimate than lovemaking. It scars long outlasting the tremors of pleasure. If I had been a cuter dyke, Odds are I would not have been the victim of Donna and Tommy's threats. If I clipped back my bangs with hot pink barrettes and made out with girls at parties while the bros gazed on, cocks thickening in their khaki polo shorts, my life would have been fewer stick lynchings, more dudes grabbing my ass in the hallways. All those high school hall molest molestations I missed out on. But I was fat, I was butch, I preferred kissing girls in my bedroom with the door closed. My crime, that of not being attractive enough for the football players, led not only the boys to threaten my life, but a whole assortment of girls who saw my inability to please the bros' sexual gaze as a crime worthy of the highest punishment. That summer, free from the threats of my high school's budding hate crimers, I packed into a car with a dozen friends and drove the 60 miles to Cleveland for this thing we'd heard about called a rave. We weren't sure where we were going or what a rave even was, but it was a Friday night. And the other option would have been to go to Mellet Mall and get an orange Julius and then stand outside the food court, sipping citrus cream while sucking smoke into our lungs hoping to score a dime bag of weed so we could go to the woods behind the mall and smoke a few joints. If that sounds exciting, I'm not describing it right. <laughs> Whatever a rave was, it was better than our usual Friday night. Plus, it was in the big city, not in Canton, that patchwork of lawns, golden retrievers, and two car garages someone decided qualified as a city. We walked in and pink strobe lights striped the air sugared with fog machine steam. The sea of teens wearing plastic bracelets up to their elbows seemed to swim through. If anyone's been to a rave, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> 
The second I entered, entered this adult candy land, the terror and anxiety that constantly knotted my insides started to loosen. I know that sounds like a narrative device. There's no way I could have instantly known that raves would be the only places I'd feel safe. No way my body reacted the second I stepped foot inside that skating rink on the east side of Cleveland. Just because I remember it this way doesn't mean that's how it happened, of course. My memory is as sentimental as anybody's. But digging into that unreliable store is the only way I can tell this story. The truest statements are sometimes the simplest. I felt free. I danced. I was queer. I had a body. Others had bodies. I pushed my body against their bodies. Our salts, our carbon dioxides, our cells twined together. We panted, sweated, touched without recoil. I danced all night, terribly, I am sure. After that, I started going to raves every weekend. I'd glitter my lids and string stars around my wrists. I'd match my feet and hips to the beat. I'd kiss Katie all night in a dirty corner of a warehouse, her lips and my lips and my hands and her hands, and no one could hear our sighs over the ooms, ooms, ooms. Those raves were not only my sluttiest, but also my most gay. Cuddle puddles made up of a dozen girl bodies, eating pussy in porta potties, getting fisted in the back seat of my mom's Honda Civic. Yeah, I was that kind of girl. <laughs> just, a little, just a little excerpt, <laughs> a little snapshot of late 90s Ohio raving. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. something else that's very gay. There's a lot of, <laughs> Lucy's very gay, so that shouldn't be too hard. Uh, let me find one of her gay poems. Um, she's in love with her best friend, Stephanie, um, but, you know, they also kind of hate each other and <laughs> treat each other like shit, which is like, what happens when you're in love with your best friend and you're 13, I guess. Okay, so this is a poem I actually never read before the reading, so um, here goes. I don't know. Hopefully it'll be good. It's slightly gay. It's not that gay. There's only a little gayness in this, but oh well, just a drop. Okay. The pool's sun, and this is Lucy and her best friend Stephanie playing in Stephanie's pool, and not playing very nicely, but whatever. The pool's sun green sheen opens like a lidless eye. Neon O promising pruned fingers, games that toy with death, sudden patches of warmth in cold water, where urine has slipped through spandex. Lucy dips her head down, and Stephanie dips her head down, and they stare with burning eyes and scream bubbles of muffled sound. They break the surface with laughing bobbing heads that chortle chemical water from nostrils. These are the rules of their game. Dip down, open your eyes, scream, fuck, shit, can't hold, bitch ass motherfucker. <laughs> Etc. Stay underwater till slurs buy you your body and you split the surface, huffing for breath. Then begin again. Warning, the consensual nature of this game may occasionally give way to rapey play. Lucy holding Stephanie's head down or Stephanie holding Lucy's head down. Lucy climbs out of the pool first. Stephanie's brother points his finger out his bedroom window, shouts, yuck, gross. Lucy, see, Lucy sees sunlight pulling into the divots that curdle her thighs, and her throat froths with disgust. As she scurries to her towel, red liquid strings down her leg. Unsure what prompted the brother's revulsion, the sight of a 13-year-old girl with cellulite or the sight of a 13-year-old girl with uterine lining down her legs. Lucy mumbles, see ya to Stephanie, and sprints back to her house. Lucy eventually forgets that day at Stephanie's pool, though she dreams monstrous teeth feast on her bones after blood liquid has seared off skin. 
She drinks pool water, lifts from its concrete bed, puckers like lips and kisses her till she's breathless and dying. She dreams a theater of boy fingers point at her spotlit and paralyzed form. That's it. Thank you.